This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our show is all about a show business legend and superstar, Doris Day. She left us on May 13th, 2019, but her phenomenal body of work as a recording artist, movie and TV star and animal activist are still with us. In searching for an expert on her life and career, I quickly learned that there is no one more qualified than today's guest. He wrote the definitive analysis simply entitled, Considering Doris Day. I'm pleased to welcome author Tom Santo Pietro. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks very much for having me on. Tom, I want to start by asking you, what made you want to write the book? I I think it was because I felt that Doris Day had never received her due. You know, she had been a huge, huge star. And yet, you know, in the late 60s into the 70s, people made fun of her. They didn't understand, you know, because the culture had changed so much. And I thought, oh, we're dismissing one of the true legends of show business. So I thought, I want to give her her due. She was, after all, the biggest female box office star in the history of the movies. That, that's right. It's not Katherine Hepburn or Julia Roberts. It is Doris Day. She was that immensely popular and incredibly skilled actress who could play anything. Did you ever get to meet her? I did not meet her because, you know, Doris was quite reclusive uh, towards the end of her life. But after the book came out, the phone rang late one night and I picked it up. And I I always say I was a little grumpy because it was really late and I had worked late and hadn't eaten dinner. And this voice said, is this Tom Pietro?" And I said, well, who's this? <laughs> and she said, I'm calling you from Carmel, California. And then I realized it was Doris. And we had an extraordinary talk for, oh, it was a solid hour. And uh, I say to people when they say, well, what was she like? Uh, the thing is, Great as her image was on screen, she was even nicer as a person. She was extraordinary. And what did she think of the book? Well, she had called me. She was very nice and complimentary. I'm not saying that, you know, in the sense of, oh, I'm such a wonderful writer, but just that she was so pleased by the book because I had taken her work so seriously. And we talked a lot about that and about her personal life and I said to her when she said how much she liked the book, I said, well, that's the only review I need. That's for sure. What an amazing experience. I'm sure you uh, did not expect to receive a call from her. I I sure didn't. And uh, she was so, not just gracious, but she was such an honest person. And that is what comes across in her singing and acting. She's not interested in irony, which is how most of us operate these days. It was straight from the heart, and that's why it works so well. I know that most people think of Doris Day as a movie star, and we will talk about her film career because she did make 39 movies, but for me, it was all about her extraordinary voice, that incredibly perfect voice. Can you tell us a bit about her career as a singer and recording artist? You're you're absolutely right. It, It starts with the voice. And, uh, you know, Doris was never going to be a singer. Uh, She was going to be a dancer and she was a really good dancer. And at age 13, she and her then partner, who was also 13, there was interest from the Hollywood studios. And the night before she left, they were in a car that got stalled and hit by a train and her leg was broken in many places. She couldn't even go back to school. And she at home, she started singing along to the radio. And she was so good, her mother had her start taking lessons. And she got her first job with a small band in Cincinnati. And then it, she moved along to bigger bands. And the story I like to tell is that the band leader said, you know, you're so great, I'm hiring you right away. She was 16. And he said, what's your name? 
And after she auditioned and she said, it's Doris Marianne von Kappelhoff. And she and he said, that's not going on a marquee. And so he said, I like the way you sang the song day after day. That's your name, Doris Day. And she always said, I've never liked the day, the name. It makes me sound like a stripper, like somebody's going to say, here's Doris Day and her two pink pigeons. (laughs) (laughs) but anyway you know and that led to the the gig with Les Brown and then uh, of course uh, Sentimental Journey her first signature song perfect pitch and uh, I would say the one other comment that's important about her singing is she always sang as if it was just she was singing to one person and that's why those recordings still hold up because it's so intimate. You think she's singing to you and telling you that story. Is that what makes her singing style so popular? Yes. I, I think it's that it's a connection that's forged with the listener and it holds up so beautifully. And I always say to people who maybe don't think of her as so much as a singer, as a movie star, I say her singing has been praised by Sarah Vaughan, Tony Bennett, and Paul McCartney. That's a pretty good trio to have saying you're a great singer. Oh, for sure. Do you have a favorite Doris Day song and a favorite album? I I do. She made one album that I actually, I know this sounds like hyperbole, but I think it's a perfect, I still call them album, that shows my age. And it's called Day by Night. And every song is about nighttime. So it's a very, very intimate feeling. And I would say everybody listening, if you can just play one cut, it's the song Moon Glow, which was, if you remember from the movie Picnic, that sexy dance with William Holden and Kim Novak. Doris Day sings that song. It's extraordinary. She's been described as a reluctant star. Why do you think that is? I think it's because it was never her ambition in life. Uh, And that's the extraordinary thing. You know, somebody I wrote, my first book uh, was about Barbara Streisand. Now, she had overwhelming ambition, right? That was what she wanted. Doris Day, it her talent was so huge that when it came along, she couldn't help but be a star. But she always said, All I wanted was to get married, keep a nice house, have children, and live in Cincinnati, and I ended up in Hollywood. It's amazing. Now, in 2011, at the age of 89, Doris released an album called My Heart, which is a compilation of previously unreleased recordings. By then, your book had been out three years. Were you shocked that a new album was released? I I was surprised because I thought that you know, Doris's life was all about animal welfare at that point. So the idea of a new recording was really surprising. But of course, it was just great to hear other songs that she had recorded from her television series. And it was, um, it actually sold really well. You know, it just shows the the devotion of her fans. And the enduring quality of her talent. Yes. I mean, it's a, that, that's the thing. All, these recordings, those great albums, that one was the more recent one. But, you know, they're from 70 years ago. And many of them sound like they were recorded yesterday. It, it's a, she was a giant talent. Okay, let's move on to the movies. Okay. To, to a great extent, your book challenges and debunks the public image that stuck to Doris Day for most of her career, the perennial virgin you say that this image of her is totally wrong. Why? I, I do say that. And I, I think it's because that tag uh, started kind of with the baby boomers in the 70s. Everybody was so concerned with being hip that they wanted to put down the, you know, the mores of previous times. But if you look closely at the films, what Doris Day it wasn't that she was hanging on to her virginity. It was that the guys were always lying to her and that's what she didn't like. And if you really look closely at Pillow Talk with Rock Hudson and Lover Come Back with Rock Hudson, Doris Day is always a career woman. 
She has a great job, a fantastic apartment. As a New Yorker, I could never figure out how she could afford that apartment. <laughs> you know, great clothes. And she loved that life. And see, that's, that is why both men and women responded to her. Because women in that era before women worked, you know, they were talking the late 50s. They aspire to that. You know, women would think, I want that life. I want that wardrobe. And for men, she was kind of the, the sexy girl next door. And so that's really the image. There's only one film where she is holding on to the virginity. It's that movie, the Touch, That Touch of Mink with Cary Grant. It's not a very good movie. But the rest of them, that it's a misreading. And I thought, I want to point this out to people. Yeah, I'm really glad you did, because most of the roles that she played in the movies were not the perennial virgin. And I, I've never understood why her popular image as the wholesome girl next door has clung to her so steadfastly. Right. It's a, it's a, I think part of that is the looking at those films through the modern day eyes and wanting to feel superior to the naivete of that era. But I, Doris Day was actually a forerunner in, in terms of her roles and in terms of an independent woman. And as you say, it's not most of her roles, you know, Love Me or Leave Me, that the great Hitchcock film, The Man Who Knew Too Much. The Pajama Game, she's a union organizer. You know, that's very far from being the perennial virgin. Do you think that Doris's talent as an actress was underappreciated by critics and the public? Oh, totally. A absolutely. It it's because she could play across all the genres, right? Alfred Hitchcock is completely different than The Pajama Game, which is completely different than Pillow Talk. And when actors make anything look effortless and they're not doing, you know, big drunk scenes or heaving breakdown scenes, people tend to underestimate and almost belittle the talent. It's a, but, but she was, <clears throat> James Cagney, who's one of the greatest film stars there's ever been, said Doris Day was one of the two best actors he'd ever seen or worked with. That's quite an endorsement coming from him. In your book, you describe Doris Day as the perfect embodiment of post-World War II America. Why do you say that? Because, uh, I like that question. <laughs> I, I, I think it's because Doris Day, my kind of way of describing it is, post-World War II, America was going to be the world's good guy. We were going to be make the world, as they said, safe for democracy, and there was no problem we couldn't solve. And there was Doris Day with that golden voice, this great-looking woman who kind of, you know, hands on her hips, and her, her persona was, in essence, let's get down to work, roll up our sleeves, there's nothing we can't accomplish. And that was America at the time. Yeah, that's very true. Do you have a favorite uh, Doris Day movie? Mine is Love Me or Leave Me. I would second that. I, oh, I, really? Yeah, it really is. I think I say I've, I've hosted screenings of the films and, you know, with the talks that uh, I sort of introduce the film and then uh, talk afterwards, these classic film societies. And to get people going and either agreeing or disagreeing when about before the movie starts I say you're about to see the best performance by an actress ever in a musical film wow I I really believe that because even you know I wrote how great Streisand is in Funny Girl and Judy Garland in A Star is Born but they're playing sanitized almost mythical creatures even though Fanny Bryce was a real woman Doris Day as Ruth Edding in Love Me or Leave Me is a tough, realistic woman. And you believe all of that action with James Cagney. I have to say my close seconds and third mm -hmm. is Pajama Game and Thrill of It All. Boy, you and I are in agreement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think Pajama Game is a really great movie. And again, showing her range, you know, that was Bob Fosse staging the musical numbers. And, and Thrill of It All, 
I think the first two thirds of that movie are so hilarious and such a great, as you said, picture of American womanhood at the time that, it, you know, it sort of cops out at the end because, uh, you know, they had to have the happy ending. But the first two thirds are so great. And again, uh, speaking about the perennial virgin image, there's a gr bit of dialogue in there where Doris Day says to her husband, staying home and bottling ketchup is not my idea of fulfillment. And you're thinking, whoa, look what she's saying in 1963. It is amazing. I have a feeling I know the answer to this, and it might have something to do with Mink, but do you have a least favorite Doris Day movie? I would say that's a close contender, but I, I think probably my least favorite of them all is a movie she made with Richard Widmark called Tunnel of Love. And I, the only good thing that came out of that movie is it's kind of a fun title song that she sings, but it's a really almost smarmy film in the writing and says terrible things about adoption of children. It's just not a good film. Well, not every piece of work from every great star is going to be perfect, but mine was a touch of mink. I didn't enjoy that at all. Right. I, I, oh, that's, and, and it is the one where she's playing that perennial virgin. And even with Cary Grant, it didn't, it just didn't work. What did you think of her TV show, The Doris Day Show, which ran for five years from 1968 to 1973? Well, I think the television show was hit and miss, as most weekly television series are. The interesting thing about the TV show was in the first season, Doris was a widow with two children and living on a farm. And it, it talk about wholesome one review, review, which I put in my book, somebody said, it's so wholesome, it makes family affair look like a meeting of the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> but what the interesting thing is, they realized changes needed to be made. And what they did starting in season two was they moved Doris to a big city with a job. See, they knew that's what her persona really was. And that's when the series started to work, was putting her in that natural setting. In so many movies and on her TV show, Doris presented as so cheerful and happy and upbeat. And yet her personal life for many years was anything but happy. She was physically, emotionally, and financially abused by more than one husband. What do you make of the choices that she made in her personal life? Oh, it's a... Uh, she had it, the worst taste in men. She had the worst taste in men. Just like Debbie Reynolds. And, you know, I think what happened with Doris is that at the beginning, you know, her first husband was the worst and he beat her while she was pregnant. And she, everybody said, don't marry him. And she did. And she was literally 18 years old. And so I think then what happened after that horrible marriage, when she finally extricated herself, as she started to become a big star, I, my own feeling is one way of wanting her husbands to feel good is she would, in effect, say, you take care of all the business. I'll perform, but you be in charge of the business affairs. And it's what led, unfortunately, to her third husband, uh, Marty Melcher, stealing all her money in cahoots with a very, very crooked lawyer. And when Doris won the settlement, uh, it was $22 million. Her husband had died. And it was the largest civil judgment in California up to that time, 1974. The, it's very interesting. The judge, you know, was completely on Doris's side. And at the end, he in effect admonished her and said, do not be so naive about your own business dealings. And she grew up. And, you know, her son was her closest confidant and advisor. But I really think that's what she did. She wanted to make Marty Melcher feel important because she was such a huge star. And it was, of course, a a, just a classic mistake and, and very, very sad. But she, I think, 
she came to terms with it. And I think she understood that Marty didn't mean to fleece her, but he was so desperate to establish his own identity. With absolute incompetence at every stage. I, I, I was so moved when her son said publicly, the best thing that ever happened to my mother is that Marty Melcher died before she would lose even more. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, it's a harsh statement, but you understand where he as a loving son was coming from. And, you know, she was so, this is another interesting thing I think about Doris's life. She was so upset that when he died, because on one level, she loved him deeply and that she said she almost had a complete breakdown. And what saved her, this is the interesting thing, and it's a motif in her life, what saved her was going back to work. And he, she didn't really know about the TV series he had signed her to do, but the fact that the TV series was starting, and Doris said the fact that she had to be somewhere every day and that other people's jobs depended on her, it gave her a purpose. And, and you see this every time her marriages broke up, she went back to work. And I, I, that's a really interesting lesson, I think. Oh, absolutely. In yeah. 1975, Doris wrote a book called Doris Day, Her Own Story. I have to tell you, I couldn't put it down because I couldn't believe all the heartache that she had gone through. What did you think of her book? Uh, much the same reaction. I, when I first read it, I just couldn't put it down. It was such a shock. You know, that was 75. We weren't quite in the tell-all stage that oh. we are now. And so you would read Doris talking about being beaten by her husband, and you would be so startled. And then uh, one of the things I liked about the book a lot was it's Doris's story told to A.E. Hotchner, but then Doris would have her co-stars comment on what their feelings about her were. And that was really honest. And just co-star after co-star said, I loved Doris so much, but I didn't like Marty Melcher. And uh, so it, it, I, I felt there was a real honesty. And uh, in later years, I got to know A.E. Hotchner. And uh, who just died uh, uh, within the past couple of years, and he just thought she was the greatest. He he really loved Doris Day a lot, and he had a great. I I think it's in the book, but he said it to me. Such a great description of Doris. He said that they were meeting for lunch, and he got there first, and then he said Doris arrived in a chariot of sunshine. Oh, oh, that's such a great phrase. It sure is. And so, so apt. Did her book give you insight when you were writing your book? Oh, definitely it did. It, it made me, uh, I understood on the levels on which she was operating. In other words, that she was this huge star, but that it hadn't been her life's ambition. And I got a sense of what really mattered to her in, in life. And that informed my book and wanting to really discuss her devotion to animal welfare. And I think the point uh, that I try to emphasize with people is, you know, we're, we're used to egos and temper tantrums in, in Hollywood stars. And Doris Day was the exception. This was a genuinely nice woman. The, the other huge star on her level that I, the only other one I can think of as nice and genuine was Audrey Hepburn. Yeah, I think Carol Burnett is in that category too. Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good, good point. In 1985, Doris appeared on TV with Rock Hudson, who was clearly unwell with AIDS, but he had not come out about it yet. He died a few months later. Do you think Doris's appearance with Rock Hudson and her obvious compassion for him helped the public become more enlightened about HIV and AIDS? I actually do. I, I think, you know, if we put ourselves back in that time frame, AIDS was, it was almost as if people were whispering the word. I, I think definitely Doris hugging Rock Hudson made a made a difference, a big difference, because Rock Hudson put a public face on AIDS for the first time. 
Uh, he was known to everybody, this huge uh, movie star. But people with AIDS were still treated as pariahs. People didn't want to touch them, be with them. And there was Doris hugging her co-star her visibly sick co-star and talking about how much she loved him. And I think that sent such a clear message to the public. I've, I've thought about that a lot because those of us from our generation lived mm -hmm. through that epidemic. And I could only think of Princess Diana as the only other public person. And then later Elizabeth Taylor, who did that, who tried right. to make the public have some compassion for people who were afflicted by a virus. I, I think that's exactly right. It, it's, it, it was a lesson in empathy. And I think all, it's very interesting you bring up Princess Diana and Elizabeth Taylor along with Doris Day. And what I would say, say is that when you achieve that level of fame, you are known around the world, you are beloved by tens of millions of people. I think all what all three women began to realize is the adulation is nice, but it doesn't matter. What do I want to do with the time I have left that can make a difference to make the world a better place? And I, I really think for all three women, you know, with Doris, the signal to rock, and then the extraordinary work with animals, that was her answer to what can I do to make the world a better place. Doris was not like many stars of her generation, like Betty Davis, for example, who kept on working right to the end. She made her last movie in 1968, and as far as I know, she rarely appeared in public after her TV show about her pets ended in 1986. She retired from show business and never looked back. I know she turned all of her attention to her pet foundation, but did it bother you that someone with so much talent and whose fan base was so huge simply turned her back on that entire part of her life? I, I had a, a two-sided reaction to it because on the one hand, I admired her knowing what she wanted to do you know, with the questions we all ask ourselves with the time I have left, how do I want to spend it? And with whom do I want to spend it? And the fact that she listened to her, you know, uh, her own heart was admirable. But as a huge fan of hers, I just wanted more work. You know, I think about, it's a well-known fact that the director, Mike Nichols, wanted Doris Day to play Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. And I think, oh, if only she had done that and she would have been great and worked with a director like that. And, you know, what if she had kept recording when her in the 70s, when her voice was still in shape? You know, I know it's a little selfish of me, but when you're a fan, you just want to see more work. Well, as a fan, I was so moved by her performances and it troubled me to know that she put that part of her life behind her and didn't care about it anymore when I still cared so much about it. Right. I know it's a it, that that's a real dichotomy. But what I would say in response to that is, although she didn't care to perform any longer, because remember, she had been performing from the time she was 16. So she worked nonstop, basically, from 1939, 1940, up to 1980, let's say. That's a, that's a long career. But I think even though she no longer wanted to perform, Doris Day was always grateful to her fans. She didn't call them her fans. She called them her friends. And she would actually try to answer as much mail as possible. And I think she was so grateful to people for that. So that's a nice thing to think about, even when we're thinking, oh, if only she had done more. You're right about that. I, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that. It does give me a different perspective that she did show the respect for the fans. I, I want to talk to you about recognition. Mm -hmm. Doris never won an Oscar, but she did get the Cecil B. DeMille Award at the 1989 Golden Globes. She turned down a request from the American Film Institute to do a tribute to her, and she turned down the Kennedy Center honor because they wanted her to attend in person and she wouldn't go. She got three Grammy Hall of Fame awards for her recordings of Sentimental Journey, Secret Love, and Que Sera Sera. 
She was inducted into the Hit Parade Hall of Fame in 2007, and she got a Grammy for Lifetime Achievement in 2008. And she also was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President George W. Bush in 2004. My question to you is, do you think she really got how talented she was and how beloved she was? Uh, that is an essential question. It's a, that's a great question. And I think the answer to realizing how beloved she was, I think that came the older she got. I think she was astonished that 40 years after she had stopped working, she'd still be getting 200 fan mail uh, letters every week. And uh, so I think that made an impression on her and why she was so grateful to the, to the fans. And I, I think Doris never would toot her own horn. I think she was secure in her talent. This is the other part of your question. And she knew, she said movie acting always came so easily to her. She instinctively knew where her mark was, where the key light was, uh, but she never had an ego about it. And I, I would tell the story that in, during that extraordinary hour long talk I had with her, they had released a boxed set of every single recording Doris had ever done. So this is 600 songs. And I said to her, well, it's just the most extraordinary document. And she said to me, and this is in sincerity. She said, well, Tom, you know, they sent me a, a, a bo the box set, it's four box sets of the 600 songs. And she said, I thought to myself, oh, isn't that nice? And I put it on the shelf. And she said, my son Terry came over and said, what is that doing on the shelf? Do you realize nobody gets a tribute like that? I want you to at least listen to part of it. And Doris Day said to me, so Tom, I screwed up my courage and I listened to my early recordings and I thought to myself, oh, I sang on key and I thought, I said to her, you did a lot more than sing on key. You're one of the greatest singers we've ever had. But that was, she was securing the talent and yet had no ego about it. That's what's so interesting to me. Yes, and it comes across, there are a number of interviews with Doris Day on YouTube, particularly in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. She conveyed an incredible sense of serenity and optimism and even forgiveness. She didn't miss show business. She didn't, she seemed so grateful for the life she had led. I think that attitude has something to do with why she lived so long. Do you think so? Oh, absolutely. A absolutely. Because she was a woman who, and as you pointed out earlier, had had such a tumultuous personal life. And the peace she had in the last decades of her life after she moved to Carmel, California, which she loved so much, I think that peace informed literally informed her physical health as well as her emotional well-being. And I think it is why she lived so long, that she was very, very content. I think she was certainly, I would say to you, in tune with nature and appreciated. She not only loved the animals, but she appreciated the literally the everyday beauty of living where she did the flowers. She loved flowers. And I think it's you know, the play Our Town by Thornton Wilder, uh, which the message of which is, of course, that none of us ever appreciate the day-to-day -day little moments of how beautiful life is. But I think in the latter part of Doris Day's life, she had achieved that. Her only child, Terry Melcher, died in 2004 when Doris was 82 years old, essentially leaving her with no family. She went on to live to the age of 97, and in her last few years, she was very fragile and very reclusive. There are a lot of rumors about who was actually in control of her affairs during those years and what's going on with her estate now. Can you tell us anything about how she spent those last few years and what's happening with the estate? I, I think she did. She was uh, surrounded by people that did care for her. I, I don't think, you know, there certainly were no, that I know of any financial shenanigans, which is what you always wonder about in a situation like that. And 
they are, uh, you know, they're making a mini television miniseries about Doris's life. And uh, I know the people that were close to her. And it was really the people uh, who ran uh, the Doris Day Animal Foundation. And those people are involved with the miniseries and have said they want to make sure that the tone pays proper tribute to Doris. So uh, that's my way of saying to you, although I don't know the details, I, I, don't, I think she was well taken care of at the end of her life. Well, that's good to hear because I think it gives comfort to the fans that have been so worried about it. Yes. I, want to, I, I want to mention for all the Doris Day fans out there that there will be a special Doris Day Forever tribute DVD coming soon. And you can get all the details from dorisdaytribute.com, which is the longest running Doris Day fan website on the internet. And I want to give a special shout out to Steve Munn, who runs that website, for his help in facilitating this interview. On behalf of all the fans, thank you for everything you do, Steve, to keep Doris Day's legacy alive. Now, Tom, I would be remiss if I did not mention that you have written and co-authored a number of other popular books about show business legends, including Bob Avian, Barbara Cook, Barbara Streisand, and Frank Sinatra. And your book about the impact of the Godfather movie trilogy on American culture is fascinating. Do you have any other books in the works? Well, First of all, I have to say, I would like to hire you as my press agent. <laughs> oh, with, with pleasure. Because <laughs> you, you just ran through all the books. It's great. <laughs> I, I do. I, I have a book that I have finished and is with my agent right now. And I don't speak specifically about it because I, I have a kind of, it's quasi superstition, but also a practicality. I talk about it when the contract is signed and when I have the first check in my hand. Because I, it's really because book deals fall apart all the time, uh, the way shows and movies fall apart. And so I just want it to be a reality, but I would say to people that it's a topic, if you love Doris Day and classic Hollywood, I think it will be of great appeal to those fans as well. Well, Tom, with your track record as an author of such fabulous books, I don't think there's going to be any question that that contract will get signed and that the check will arrive. And I hope you will consider coming back to our show to talk about some of your other books and the one that's coming out, because we would love to have you back. Uh, thanks. This has been great. It's uh, I've really enjoyed the interview. Uh, you have a terrific podcast and... Uh, you're, uh, I, it's great to talk to somebody who has the, the interest in it that I do, because really writing a book is, of course, it's nice to make money from it, but that the point of writing a book is you have an idea that you really care about and you want to share it with other people. And you obviously have the interest in the area. So the, the interview has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you so much. Well, Tom, it has been an absolute pleasure reminiscing with you about the spectacular life and career of Doris Day. Thank you for writing your wonderful book, which I highly recommend to every Doris Day fan. Thank you for spending this time with us, Tom. You are a delight to speak with. Well, th thanks very much. I, I have had a, a really great time and I hope everybody listening has had to. Our guest has been Tom Santo Pietro, author of Considering Doris Day. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.